This is a production of Cornell University. And uh, thank you for the invitation to, uh, to be here today um, and for letting me choose my own topic to speak about because those of you who know me probably know that for much of the past decade I've really worked mainly on irrigation control. My students like to say that I'm a control freak. I've been controlling irrigation. I don't want to stop there. I now want to control light and I want to control light in a smarter way than what we have done in the past. Uh, much of my work was inspired by a book that was published in 2011, I think. It's an interesting book. It is full of uh, vague claims, uh, poor understanding of plant science, but it inspired a lot of people. And quite frankly, the book was written by Dixon Despommier. We may not agree with the claims that he makes, but I think we should thank him for putting controlled environment agriculture on the forefront of, na of a national discussion about how we are going to grow food in the future. And so I think because he is incredible at PR, there are lots of uh, people who are really interested in vertical farms, in producing food in places where we may or may not be able to grow food efficiently, but it has generated a lot of research opportunities, if nothing else. I think the people who were probably most fascinated with vertical farms were architects, because as soon as this book came out, architects started, architects started making beautiful designs for what vertical farms should look like. And it is actually a lot of fun to just Google images for vertical farms, because they are absolutely beautiful. Um, they probably don't work, but I would love to see <laughs> this building right here. Wouldn't that be cool to be able to visit that? Um, let's hope someone is going to invest in that thing and make it happen. Um, German engineer, uh, engineers, not architects, they took a slightly more pragmatic approach to what it would take to actually run a vertical farm. So they came up with this design. It is not nearly as pretty, but they did all of the engineering to try to figure out what it would actually take to build a large vertical farm and produce food year-round in a facility like that. So this vertical farm has a footprint of 44 by 44 me uh, meters. It is 37 floors tall, and um, they um, probably over-engineered the building since these are aerospace engineers, and they do like to over-engineer things. But they look then at how much does it cost to build this? And this building would be a little bit over $300 million. So we need a substantial investor to be able to make that happen. But what I was more interested in is uh, the analysis that they did on what it takes to actually run that facility on a year-to-year -year basis. So it turns out that the power consumption for this vertical farm would be 400,000 kilowatts, kilowatt hours per day. And it would cost about 32 to 35 million dollars, these values here are in euros, a year to pay for the power for this electricity. Now this number probably doesn't mean a whole lot to you, but 400,000 kilowatt hours a day is pretty much, when you compare that to a household, a typical household is about 30 kilowatt hours per day. And it turns out that this number right here is probably pretty close to the power consumption of Ithaca, a city their size. So that's what it takes to run this one vertical farm. So there is a tremendous amount of power that you need to do this, and much of the cost of running these things, 60%, is in power consumption. Their calculations showed that half of this, 30% of total operating cost, was to run the LEDs. Much of the rest uh, of the power use would be for uh, air conditioning. And part of that air conditioning is, new, is needed to remove the heat that you actually get from the LEDs. So in reality, um, the cost of running lights is probably about 40 to 50% of the total cost to run a facility like this. And it's a lot of money. Um, my research uh, isn't just limited to vertical farms. This is an example of a small vertical farm that is actually just outside of um, uh, Atlanta, they're close to the airport. They located next to the airport because they get naturally 800 parts per million CO2 there, apparently just from the airplanes taking off. It's pretty amazing how much CO2 that generates. So they uh, typically use very little CO2 enrichment. They don't have to. But so you can see here that they're working with fluorescent lights. They grow these plants under amazingly low light levels, but still for them, um, the light is a big cost for them. 
Um, in greenhouses, worst case scenario, you, you may be spending up to about $500 a day on the power to run supplemental lighting in the greenhouse. So this too, when you add that up over the course of a year, um, that can be a substantial amount of money. Just last week, I was in a 100 acre greenhouse um, where they use supplemental lighting. I don't know what the power bill is, but they spend millions of dollars a year on electricity uh, for their lighting. Um, so it can be expensive. So people think that LEDs are the solution to everything. Um, and the question is, are LEDs the solution to um, solve these lighting issues and controlled environment agriculture? First of all, when people tell you that LEDs don't generate heat, just laugh. Just start laughing right away. You hear that claim a lot. It's just not possible. So LEDs, uh, good LEDs right now, I think, are 30, maybe 40 percent efficient. That means that's the energy that gets converted into light. All of that other energy is going to have to go somewhere. That is basic physics. So all that other energy is heat that gets generated. Um, the difference between LEDs and most other lights, though, that we normally use is that the LED light itself, you can uh, get really close to it. It doesn't generate a lot of heat. It's the electronics on the backside of the LED where the heat is generated, and that heat you actually have to remove. If you don't remove that, an LED will burn up in a matter of probably milliseconds, if not seconds. Um, so LEDs have been around for a while. The two green lights show different kinds of LEDs right here. But they have really become more prevalent in the last five to 10 years. And one reason that they have become so much more common than they used to be, sorry, is that the efficiency of LEDs has rapidly increased. So it is a rapidly evolving technology. And right now, people may argue about whether they are more efficient or equally efficient as the best high pressure sodium lights that are out on the market. There may not be much of a difference in efficiency at this point. But LED technology, since it is still relatively new, is likely to become substantially more efficient than any other light source we have uh, right now. So that makes it a good choice, potentially, for supplemental lighting or for source source lighting where you grow plants in a completely enclosed environment. So another advantage, in addition to the efficiency, is that LEDs, if you use them correctly, they can last a very long time. And that using them correctly is mainly depending on making sure they don't get more power than they should because that will quickly wear them out and make sure that they cool, that they are cooled uh, appropriately. I mentioned previously that the light itself does not get hot, so that means that you can have these, li these lights very close to the canopy, or you can even put them inside of the canopy. So this is a picture of Philips light bars, where they put them inside of a tomato crop, and it doesn't burn the leaves. So that's a, that is a big difference compared to the more traditional high-intensity discharge lights that we've always used in, um, in greenhouses. Another advantage of this is that this actually allows you to get light into the bottom part of the canopy. When you use uh, traditional high-intensity discharge lights, you would have your light somewhere above the canopy, obviously, off the picture here. That light is coming down, but it is going to be absorbed almost entirely by and the leaves in the top of the canopy. So this is a way to get a more even light distribution, and that should help overall canopy photosynthesis. There is a drawback to LEDs, and they are still very expensive. They are getting cheaper. They are continuously getting cheaper. But right now, the question of whether or not it is actually cost effective to replace um, high intensity discharge lights with LEDs is a pretty tough question to answer. Do you get enough benefits from them to make it worthwhile to make that replacements? But we are still, in many cases, when I look at LED research, we are using LEDs as if they are just a replacement for traditional lights. And LEDs have much more capability than a high pressure sodium or a metal halide light. You can get them in pretty much any spectrum that you want. But what I am most interested in is controlling the light levels that we get from the LED lights and matching that light level to the physiological ability of the plants to actually use that light. So it turns out that controlling LEDs 
is actually very easy and very cheap. It's not often that you have that combination. Um, the investment is pr practically nothing if you want to do this. So with LEDs, one thing that we can do is we can very easily control the frequency at which they turn on and off. And you probably don't realize that, but a standard dimmer that you may have in this room or that you may have at home, a light dimmer, actually does the same thing. It turns off the current to your light bulb on and off um, at a high frequency. We can tell that because it goes so fast that our, our eyes cannot detect it. But so with LEDs, we can turn these lights on and off. But in addition to that, what we can do then is we can control the duty cycle of the LEDs. So what that means is within one on-off cycle, so this is off, on, and off again, how long are these LEDs actually on? So in this example here, we have a 50% duty cycle. And that basically gives us effectively half of the light output that you get from when the LEDs are on full time. So this would be a medium light level. If we go to a 10% duty cycle, the LEDs are only on a small um, amount of the time, and you get a much lower light level. And then likewise, if you increase the duty cycle, you get higher light levels. So adjusting that duty cycle is really easy. I didn't realize that this until I asked an engineer if he could build a board for me. And he said, well, yes, I could, but I'll just have an undergrad put it together for you. Um, apparently, it is that complicated. Um, so sometimes it is good to talk to engineers. Is Lou here? Um, so wh what I am focused on is what I want to do is to optimize the light use efficiency. So I'm going to go through the physiology of what actually happens to light when you are providing light to a crop. And then that will get us to how we are using that um, plant, physiolog plant physiological background to actually control the lights. So ultimately, what really needs to happen in the light reactions of photosynthesis is that we have to make NADPH and ATP. Plants don't use light very efficiently, necessarily. Sometimes they do, sometimes they, d they don't. It largely depends on how much light you give them. The more light you give a plant, the less efficiently the plant is actually using that light. But the way this works um, in the chloroplast is that light gets, gets absorbed by chlorophyll molecules. And what hopefully will happen is that excitation energy from that photon is transferred from one chlorophyll to another, and ultimately to the reaction center of either photosystem one or photosystem two. And there, that energy from that photon is used to move an electron from one or from a donor to an acceptor. And then there is an, a whole electron transport chain that follows this. So this process is referred to as photochemistry. This is what we want to happen with the light that is absorbed by leaves. And when that happens, so this gives you a better idea of the overall electron transport uh, chain. We have a photon that comes, in this case, from the sun. It reaches the reaction center of photosystem two. And then the electron goes from water. It is transported initially to this point. And this is the rate limiting step. I'll come back to that later. This turns out to be important for some of the work that we do. Um, and if it gets past this bottleneck, then that electron moves ultimately to NADPH. And now we have reductant that gets produced that can be used in the Kelvin cycle to ultimately make carbohydrates. At the same time, what is happening in this process is that hydrogen actually moves from the stroma into the lumen. And hydrogen is produced from the splitting of water right here. So we get a pH gradient across this membrane. And that, that pH gradient is used right here to make ATP. So now we have NADPH and ATP. And that is ultimately the energy that is going to drive the Kelvin cycle. Unfortunately, not all of the light that is absorbed by a leaf is actually used for photochemistry. Some of the light is actually going to be converted into heat. And plants have the ability to control how much of that light gets converted into heat. And that control is actually based on that pH gradient that develops across the thylakoid membrane inside of the chloroplast. So we're moving hydrogens into the lumen. If a plant can use all of this hydrogen to make ATP, then we don't get much of a drop in pH right here. But if the hydrogen transport across this membrane 
is faster than the rate at which that hydrogen can be used to make ATP, then we get a drop in pH right here. If that happens, that triggers an enzymatic activation. There is an enzyme called violaxanthin viol deepoxidase that gets activated by low pH inside of the lumen. Uh, violaxanthin deepoxidase converts violaxanthin, which is a xanthophyll pigment that is present in the, uh, in the thylakoid membrane. It converts it to anthrazanthin and subsequently to zeaxanthin. And that uh, conversion is reversible when the pH increases again. The reason that this conversion is important is that violaxanthin is a pigment that helps chloroplasts absorb light and transfer that light to the reaction centers. When violaxanthin gets converted into anthrazanthin or zeaxanthin, these two pigments actually act very differently. Those two pigments cause um, <coughs> the absorbed light energy to be converted into heat. They have an impact on the surrounding chlorophyll molecules and prevent chlorophyll molecules from transferring that energy from one chlorophyll molecule to another, and instead that energy now is lost as heat. That may seem like a bad thing, but this is a way that plants can protect themselves from excess light. And then there is a third potential fate for absorbed light energy, and that is chlorophyll fluorescence. This doesn't seem to be something that is actually actively controlled by plants, but it happens. So um, you cannot see it, but every plant that is exposed to light is fluorescing. It is giving off red light with a wavelength of around 690 nanometers. You actually can see it if you get a green laser pointer and you point that at a leaf, you can see a reddish glow where you hit that leaf. That is actually red photons coming from that leaf after you give it only green light. Um, so chlorophyll fluorescence, it turns out, is actually really easy to measure. Um, there are very good techniques out there. You can buy the equipment, not necessarily cheap, but it's not difficult to do. Um, so this is an example here of a chlorophyll fluorometer. When we measure chlorophyll fluorescence, basically what we are measuring is how much light is emitted from that leaf um, at a wavelength of around 695 nanometers. And so this is light that is emitted. That photon is created inside of the leaf. It is not reflected. That's a very different thing. And so to measure that, we typically measure the fluorescence coming from the leaf under ambient light conditions. And then in this picture right here, you can see a very bright spot right here where you also measure the chlorophyll fluorescence when you give the leaf an amount of light that completely saturates all of the photosystems in that little part of the leaf. Um, and from those measurements, we can actually calculate all kinds of things. And this is where we can get a lot of in-depth physiological information incredibly easily. I'm still always a bit dumbfounded when I think about the biophysical processes that we can measure so easily by shining a light onto a leaf. Um, so if you take these measurements on a leaf, that uh, has been in the dark for a while, then you can measure something called the maximum quantum yield of photosystem 2. And that indicates whether that leaf is healthy or not, whether photosystem 2 in that leaf has been damaged by heat, excess light, salinity, whatever. It doesn't matter. But you can detect whether or not there's damage to photosystem 2. So for a healthy leaf, you're typically looking for a maximum quantum yield of 0.82. What that value of 0.82 means is that under those conditions, that leaf uses 82% of the light that it absorbs for photochemistry, for electron transport. And that's the process that we need to get transpiration, uh, sorry, to get photosynthesis. Um, we can take these same measurements on a leaf that is exposed to light, and now we can measure the intrinsic quantum yield in light. And that is actually more interesting because that actually tells us um, under, let's say, greenhouse conditions, if you do this in a greenhouse, you can measure how efficiently that plant is using the light that it is getting. What fraction of light that is absorbed by the leaf is actually used for photochemistry. So that, in principle, is something that we would like to be as high as possible. We want plants to use light as efficiently um, uh, as possible. If we know the 
quantum yield of photosystem 2, the intrinsic quantum yield, we can actually, so that's going to be abbreviated as phi PS2, the fo efficiency of photosystem 2, we can calculate the electron transport rate of photosystem 2 because we know the efficiency with which light is used. We can very easily measure the amount of, life, uh, of light that is getting to the leaf. And we typically make the assumption that 84% of the light that reaches a leaf is going to be absorbed by that leaf. That's a value that is roughly accurate for a wide range of different species. And then we multiply that uh, by 0 0.5, and that is to account for the fact that we have two photosystems, and the assumption is that half of the light is going to photosystem 2, half of the light is going to photosystem 1. And then based on that, um, we can calculate the electron transport rate in, in that leaf. And so we got all of that basically from shining a light onto that leaf and measuring how much fluorescence is emitted from that leaf. Um, the last parameter that I want to talk about that we can calculate is non-photochemical quenching. Non-photochemical quenching is an indicator of um, the activity of the xanthophyll cycle, how much of the absorbed light energy is actually converted into heat. So non-photochemical quenching, in principle, we would like to be low because um, if you get a lot of thermal dissipation of light energy, that means that the efficiency of photosystem 2 is going down. Less light is actually being used for photochemistry. And this is calculated from the fluorescence that you measure under that saturated light pulse. Um, so our goal, um, we started on this about a year and a half ago, was to develop a biofeedback system to measure chlorophyll fluorescence, then calculate the electron transport rate, and then adjust the duty cycle of the LEDs to maintain whatever electron transport rate we program into the system. And so before we started doing that, um, we needed to understand just what these plants were doing under LED lights. So we had um, an LED light right here with a power supply, a plant below it, a fluorometer for chlorophyll fluorescence connected to a data logger. The data logger is controlling the fluorometer. It tells the fluorometer when to take a measurement and it gets the data from the fluorometer then and a light sensor so that we can calculate the electron transport rate. Um, so we just collect the data under steady state conditions where we turn the LEDs on. This is a picture of what it looks like inside of the growth chamber. This is a very early picture. You can actually see the flickering nature of the LEDs in that picture this, that was captured by the camera right here. These stripes that you see is actually uh, the result of how the camera shutter is detecting uh, the light. And this is our rather ugly control system that runs the whole system. It's not pretty, but it works most of the time. Um, so when we expose these plants, this was with lattice, for, uh, in this case, this was 14 hours, I believe, um, to 400 micromoles of photosynthetic uh, photon flux, what we see over the course of that period is that the electron transport rate gradually decreases. And the electron transport rate decreases because the efficiency of photosystem 2 decreases over time. And the efficiency of photosystem 2 decreases because non-photochemical quenching is upregulated um, as these plants are exposed to these relatively high light levels for lattice for a prolonged period. One thing that I do want to point out, though, is that the scales here, when we look at the magnitude of the change, it's actually fairly small. So we have about a 5% change decrease in electron transport rate. The same for the efficiency of photosystem 2 decreases by about 5%. NPQ, those values are just really difficult to interpret. The number itself doesn't mean a whole lot other than that a higher value indicates that more of the absorbed light is being converted into heat. No, these plants were under 16 hours of light, 8 hours of dark. Um, so when we look at the relationship between non-photochemical non quenching and the efficiency of photosystem 2, you see that there is a pretty nice relationship between the two. So that uh, is very consistent with the idea that the upregulation of the xanthophyll cycle um, 
is a mechanism that decreases um, the efficiency of photosystem too, but at the same time helps to protect the plants against damage from excess light. So um, we, have th we had this system where we just had LEDs and we could measure the plants below them. So we had to adapt this system to actually give us control, active control over the LEDs. So uh, the engineer that I mentioned previously, he built us a duty cycle and frequency control board. Um, we can control that from the data logger um, by sending a voltage signal using an analog output module to the frequency control board. And now the data logger can tell the LED lights basically what duty cycle should you maintain? What should the frequency be? And I'm not going to talk about frequency. That has turned out to be a really boring aspect of everything that we've done. It had no impact whatsoever. Um, but the duty cycle, basically, when we adjust, adjust the duty cycle, we're adjusting um, the light level that we give to the plants. Um, so the question was, can we maintain a steady electron transport rate? Well, so we tried, we actually used a different lattice plan this time, but we tried to maintain a stable electron transport rate of 70 micromoles per square meter per second. Um, so that is 70 micromoles of electrons that move through one square meter of leaf in one second. And other than the first few minutes, we were actually able to control that electron transport rate, I thought, very nicely. We were very happy to see this. As I'll point out in a second, it was amazingly easy to control the electron transport rate at 70 micromoles, though. Um, but we tried different levels. So this is a similar graph with higher uh, electron transport rates. It's a little bit more noisy, but overall, we still have very nice control over the electron transport rate. So we have a way now that we can actually control the rate of the light reactions of photosynthesis by simply adjusting the duty cycles of the LEDs. One of the nice thing about fluorescence measurements is that you get a lot of physiological information. So this showed how the efficiency of photosystem two changed with an electron transport rate uh, set at 70. And the efficiency of photosystem two is always the same. There was no down regulation. Um, so what that basically means is to maintain an electron transport rate of 70 micromoles per square meter per second. If the efficiency of the leaf doesn't change, you're always maintaining the same light level, and you're right there. So you just turn the lights on, walk away, and you're actually fine. Um, there wasn't any active control needed. One thing that was good to see is that in the dark, before and after the trial, we got quantum yields of over 0 0.8. And that indicates that these leaves were actually healthy and not damaged um, during this process. I'll get back to that later, but it turns out we can actually cause severe damage to the leaves just by taking these measurements. So when I add the quantum yield of photosystem to uh, for the higher electron transport rates to this, first of all, you see that the efficiency is lower when you have higher electron transport rates. When you give plants more light, again, they use that light less efficiently. So we see a decrease in the quantum yield of about 0.63 to maybe 0.58 or so. So the plants at this higher light level did become less and less efficient over time. So we also looked at non-photochemical quenching. What we see at the lower electron transport rate is that non-photochemical quenching is very boring and always the same. When we go to higher electron transport rates, we have more non-photochemical quenching than at lower electron transport rates because we have more light. And at the same time, we see that non-photochemical quenching is upregulated over the course of this day. So the plant is inducing that xanthophyll cycle activity to help protect itself from light damage. And then ultimately, when we look at uh, the light levels that were needed to maintain these electron transport rates, so this is the light that we needed over this period to maintain an electron transport rate of 70. So basically, the biofeedback system that we developed didn't have to make any adjustments whatsoever. Um, the light level of 240 micromoles per square meter per second was just um, what these plants needed. Um, at the higher target electron transport rate of 100, though, we see that the biofeedback system needed to upregulate the duty cycle and the light level to maintain a stable rate of electron transport. Um, 
So it showed us that the system works. That was exciting enough to see. In the early days of this work, the whole lab group would come sit around the lattice plant in the lab, and we would just see what would happen next to the light we had hooked up to it. And it was actually really fascinating to watch that plant basically adjusting the light to whatever level it needed. Um, we were also interested in seeing what rates can we actually achieve with this kind of a biofeedback system. Um, we worked with different species. I am only going to talk about lattice because the other species didn't respond all that differently, so it's not that interesting. And we were interested in looking at what is the physiology that underlies the processes that, uh, that we see. So our goal was to maintain the electron transport rate of lattice at different levels over the course of a day. So we would increase the target electron transport rate according to this dotted line that you see right here going from initially zero up to 70 micromoles per square meter per second and then back down again. Because we had each target electron transport rate for only one hour, we were collecting chlorophyll fluorescence data more often in the study to give the system enough time to measure electron transport rate at a particular level and to make the needed adjustments in the duty cycle of the LEDs to be able to maintain that electron transport rate. So here we were measuring every two minutes. Um, and so this is the level of control that we got. That actually, I thought, looked pretty good, where we can maintain these different electron transport rates pretty well. So we reached a limit right here. This plant simply couldn't do any more than this. And then going back down again, we regain control of the electron transport rate. But so one thing that you may notice here, hopefully you didn't, this is where things didn't work. The maximum electron transport rate that we got was only about 60 micromoles per square meter per second. I just showed you in the previous studies that we had no trouble maintaining electron transport rates of uh, up to 100 micromoles per square meter per second. Um, so when we looked at the light levels, that were needed to achieve these electron transport rates. We see a stepwise pattern here. We were maxing out the light that we could get from the LEDs. And then it goes back down again. But one thing that is interesting in this is that we needed a lot more light to maintain a specific electron transport rate during the first half of the trial than during the second half of the trial. So both of these lines indicate the light level needed to maintain an electron transport rate right here of 10 micromoles per square meter per second. But at the end of the day, we needed almost twice as much light as we did during the beginning of the day. And so our initial thought was, well, this is upregulation of non-photochemical quenching in these plants. We see the same difference here at an uh, electron transport rate of 50. This is the difference in light level that we needed at this point in time versus this point in time. Um, so these plants were becoming less and less efficient over the course of this 14-hour uh, period. When we uh, looked at the efficiency of photosystem 2, or the quantum yield, we see that during the initial part of that trial, the quantum yield dropped, which is what we would expect as you increase light levels the efficiency of photosystem 2 increases. But the efficiency did not really go up a whole lot during the second half of the trial until we actually turned off the lights. So the efficiency of photosystem 2 here did not recover. And when I took a closer look at these data, another thing that I noticed was that when we look at the quantum yield, this initial data right here, that's in the dark. First of all, these values are pretty low. We started about 0.72. And then the efficiency of photosystem 2 was decreasing during that initial hour in the dark. So that was actually indicating that our measurements, us measuring chlorophyll fluorescence, was changing the efficiency of photosystem 2. And then at the end of the trial, when we measured the yield again here in the dark, we only got quantum yields of around 0 0.6, 0 0.6 at the end of the day. And that told us we are really damaging these leaves. Um, so this indicates a problem, and we have now narrowed that problem down to the fact that we were simply measuring chlorophyll fluorescence too often. And it's that saturating light pulse that has an intensity of around 6,000 micromoles per square meter per second. That's a lot of light. That is three times of the maximum amount of light that you may get during the middle of summer. And exposing that leaf to that very high light level every two minutes 
was actually causing damage to that leaf. So when we look at the changes in non-photochemical quenching, we see that non-photochemical quenching gets upregulated as the light levels increase. And non-photochemical quenching is actually nicely downregulated again as we decrease light levels when we try to maintain progressively lower electron transport rates. So non-photochemical quenching could not explain the difference that we saw in yield um, early in this trial versus late in this trial. This is another way to look at this. So the solid symbols right here, they indicate the relationship between non-photochemical quenching and the measured quantum yield. And we see this is in the dark. Um, the yield decreases as non-photochemical quenching increases. But then during the second half of the trial, as the light levels decrease, non-photochemical quenching decreases again, but the yield doesn't increase the way you would expect. Um, so after I realized that this was happening, um, we had a lab meeting to talk about this. It took us a while to figure out what was going on. Why do we not see that yield recovering in the afternoon, um, even though non-photochemical quenching gets down regulated? And then we took a look at the raw data from the fluorescence measurements. And so this is the fluorescence that is measured under the saturating light. This is an indicator of non-photochemical quenching. The lower this value, the more non-photochemical quenching. And we see that uh, stepwise pattern that is associated with changes in the electron transport rate, changes in light level, and a recovery again later in the day. Um, the next line, this is the fluorescent signal that we measured on these leaves under ambient light conditions without the saturating light pulse. And what we saw early in the day is that that fluorescence increased, and that is normal as light levels increase. But during the second half of the day, that fluorescence didn't decrease back down again. That fluorescence actually kept increasing. And this indicates damage that we had caused to photosystem 2 by trying to measure chlorophyll fluorescence more frequently than these plants could handle. So the way that that damage happens is through a process that is called photoinhibition. So under normal conditions, you have an active photosystem 2 that is capable of um, taking an electron from water and moving it on through the electron transport chain. If you apply too much light to plants, photosystem 2 can actually become inactivated. And it is actually a really ingenious mechanism through which this works. So if you have too much light, Basically, what happens is that too many electrons get taken from a water molecule. These electrons normally would be moving through this electron transport chain, but they can't in this case because there is so much light that there is not enough capacity. That electron is going to react with something. And in this case, what happens is that in photosystem 2, that excess energy is actually specifically directed towards a protein that is called the D1 protein. That protein gets damaged, and the plant can then take that protein out of the reaction center of photosystem 2 and put a new one in. But this takes a few hours, so it is a slow repair process. But think about how, how ingenious this is. When you think about this in the context of your car, let's say you're driving your car, something goes wrong in the engine. If you had a smart engine that was as smart as a plant, that engine would direct whatever is going wrong in that engine to your first spark plug, make that blow up. And all you need to do to repair it is replace that spark plug, no matter what. That is basically what plants have done. They direct all of that energy, well, maybe not all, but they direct that energy to the D1 protein. And then the plant essentially knows what it needs to repair. It's the D1 protein that needs to be repaired. And obviously, plants have a very efficient mechanism to repair that protein because they know that that is what uh, is going to be damaged. So we get this photo inhibition. Plants can reactivate uh, photosystem 2, but this can be a matter of hours. So what we saw in our trials, we think, we're pretty confident about this, is photo inhibition that was induced by those light pulses. So what we do know from these studies is that we can control electron transport rate over a wide range of different levels. Uh, we can do it in many species. I haven't shown that here because it's not really interesting to look at the same graphs for different species. 
when we do get high electron transport rates, that is associated with a low yield and high non-photochemical quenching. So um, we also found that too frequent of measurements can result in photo inhibition. And what we do now is we measure that fluorescence under saturating light only once every 15 minutes. And that seems to be fine. We're not seeing any damage from that. But the good thing is that we can actually see photo inhibition happening if we take a close enough look at the data, because that photo inhibition should be evident from an upward trend in the basal fluorescence that you're measuring. So this was part of, uh, of what we've been working on. We have a biofeedback system. And now that we understand the damage that we get from the measurements, um, I think we'll be able to run this without causing damage from the measurements. But we're working on other things as well. And one thing that LEDs have done is they have actually generated a lot of interest in McCree's action spectrum of photosynthesis. So this curve right here shows how efficiently plants use different wavelengths of photons for photosynthesis. And it's normalized to a peak of one right here. So with LEDs, we can actually get very specific wavelengths. And there is a lot of interest right now in trying to recreate the action spectrum and see if this holds up under LEDs and see if it holds up under different light intensities. So because there is a lot of interest in this, I'm not doing it. Other people are. And what I'm going to do is try to convince you that this doesn't work, because that's much more fun. I like to be contrarian. But so because the efficiency is relatively high in the blue and red part of the spectrum, and we have good LEDs in those uh, wavelengths, efficient LEDs, the typical grow light now has a mixture of red and blue LEDs. We are actually using some of these exact same lights. This is just another grow light. But that has become the standard, mixing red and blue, in some cases, white LEDs. But what Keith McCree, in his groundbreaking work in the 60s, didn't seem to think about was even more groundbreaking work that was done in the 50s by Emerson. So Emerson is largely credited for doing the initial research that showed that there were actually two different photosystems that work together in electron transport rate. And what Emerson did was he looked at photosynthetic rates if we only give plants light with wavelengths greater than 680 nanometers. And what he found was that you get very low photosynthetic rates. And with what we know now, that is actually to be expected, because photosystem 2 can only use light with wavelengths of 680 or below, while photosystem 1 can use light up to 700 nanometers. So with this kind of light, you're really only stimulating photosystem 1, not photosystem 2. So what Emerson also found, and I think we have failed to really recognize the importance of this, is that if you give plants light with wavelengths only below 680 nanometers, and that's this right here, we also get low photosynthetic rates. But that light can still excite photosystem 2 and photosystem 1 both. But we still get only very low photosynthetic rates. And when we combine these two lights, then you get this right here. You get much, much higher photosynthetic rates, much higher than, using e well, than the combination of these two lights when used individually. So there is a synergistic effect of light below and light above 680 nanometers. Um, and the idea behind that is that I showed this slide before. The rate limiting step in the electron transport chain is right here, where this electron needs to be uh, transferred to um, a plastic quinone right here. And that will allow that electron to move further down the electron transport chain. So we often say that photosystem 2 is the rate limiting step for the light reactions. And that is because photosystem 2 right here is not capable of donating this electron to the plastic quinone pool right here if most of that plastic quinone pool has already been reduced. There is only so much plastic quinone. But um, based on what Emerson found, basically what we can do is if we excite photosystem 1 more, what we can do is reoxidize all these downstream intermediates in the electron transport chain. And if we can oxidize the plastic quinones right here, 
then they can accept another electron and photosystem two now is capable of transferring that electron more efficiently and electron transport can occur at a higher rate, theoretically. So there goes the electron all the way to NADPH. So um, I told a graduate student of mine about 10 days ago if she could get me convincing data on this by last Wednesday, so she had about four days to do this, I'll let you go to the light symposium at Michigan State. And she got pretty motivated, so she grabbed uh, a red and blue LED bar that has this spectrum right here. And we have some far red LEDs sitting in the lab. And she added incrementally more um, far red light to it. And then she measured photosynthetic rates. And she measured um, the quantum yield of photosystem too. And so this is the far red LED right here. It adds practically no photosynthetically active radiation. There is virtually no light below 700 nanometers. So when she did that, the y-axis here is really confusing because this data is so new that we haven't figured out yet how we actually want to express this. But this indicates the current that we were giving to the far red LEDs. It's basically the intensity of the far red light. So it goes from zero with the far red off to more and more far red light. And then the far red light turned off again. And what we see is indeed an increase in photosynthesis that is disproportional to the amount of light that we were adding. So we have now made the great discovery that science done in the 50s was actually right. But I think we have forgotten about the science from the 50s. And that's really the point I'm trying to make. Um, it is really worthwhile to look at some key papers from a very long time ago. Um, because there is a lot of good information out there. And what we were also able to do, what Emerson never could do, because he didn't have the equipment, we looked at the quantum yield of photosystem two, and it actually follows a very, very similar pattern. But the increase that we see in the quantum yield of photosystem two is actually not as big as the increase that we see in photosynthesis. So this by itself doesn't explain the entire um, effect that we see on the actual photosynthetic measurements. Um, we haven't had any time to look at this in more depth or to think about this a whole lot. Um, I got these graphs on Saturday, I think. So, um, But I think it's just interesting to go back to that old literature. And so there was a lot of interest in McCree's action spectrum of photosynthesis. And the reason that I say maybe it's not all that important is that that action spectrum that McCree developed, and it, it was great work. But it assumes that all of these wavelengths are acting independently. And they don't. We know from Emerson that far red light has a synergistic effect. And that becomes really difficult to capture in an, uh, in an action spectrum. That might mean that you need to develop an action spectrum with different amounts of far red light added to it or something like that. And is far red light the only kind of light that has this kind of an effect? Who knows? We can't possibly test all different possibilities, all different wavelengths of light, because there would be hundreds, if not thousands, of different wavelengths that you can combine to try to figure out what the most efficient combination actually is. So we did see that far red light has a synergistic effect. So again, that is nothing new, but it is, I thought, was worthwhile revisiting. And it does increase the uh, quantum yield of photosystem two. It does make photosystem two more efficient, presumably because it helps to reoxidize that plastoquinone pool that photosystem two needs to donate the electron to. And again, wavelengths do not have independent effects. So how can we come up with an action spectrum for photosynthesis? Um, something to think about. So our future goal is to um, try to commercialize some of this biofeedback technology. And I'm doing that in collaboration with a local startup company called Phytosynthetics. Um, that was actually uh, a company that was started by two graduate students that I had in a photosynthesis class that I taught um, eight or 10 years ago. We talked about some of these ideas. Um, they talked to their advisor about it. He got a patent on the technology without telling me about it. Um, <laughs> and the two students started uh, two years ago this company to try to get this uh, technology to market. So I'm now working with uh, Phytosynthetics pretty closely to, um, to do all of this. 
Uh, so one of the things that we want to do is to build a low-cost chlorophyll fluorometer that is done between phytosynthetics and an engineering professor. The instrument we use costs $15,000. Um, we hope we can build something for three or $400. That would make this a lot more appealing to potential users. Um, so this is a picture of the prototype of uh, the fluorometer. You can see the saturating light pulse coming from a laser right here, shining onto that leaf. Um, I hope that uh, in the next week or two, they'll get me an updated version of this fluorometer that may actually work. Um, apparently, it's not easy to build a chlorophyll fluorometer. Um, I would like to uh, thank uh, Juanito Ferraresi. He was the postdoc in my lab who built the very first iteration of the biofeedback system. Uh, Jeff Weaver, who I subsequently hired to work on this project and who will hopefully become my PhD student soon, um, did a lot of work on this. Xu Yang Zen is a PhD student in my lab. She did the work uh, revisiting the Emerson effect and my current postdoc working on this, Michael Martin, the whole lab crew. I would also like to thank Dixon Despommier for getting this topic on the radar. Um, because again, I don't think that uh, I would have been able to get the funding I got if it hadn't been for his pie in the sky, well, corn in the sky views. Um, so we may really disagree with what he did, but I think he has done us a great favor in many ways as well. Um, and these are the various funding agencies uh, that obviously I would like to thank as well. And hopefully with that we have time left for questions. Well, so if you light your plants 24-7, um, you may have an increase in non-photochemical quenching over time, and you may be decreasing the quantum yield of photosystem too. So that may or may not happen, but I, I would love to see data on that before I would make any hard claims about that. I'm not convinced that you would necessarily maintain a stable electron transport rate if you keep the plants in the light all the time. And some plants don't tolerate it, like tomatoes, uh, they need they rest at night. Um, have you tried growing lettuce on the continuous light? I never have. And lettuce is fine with it? Yeah. Um, maybe it would be easy enough to find out if you have changes in quantum yield. Yeah, so no, it is not a whole lot of light. It is a 0.8 second pulse. So if you were to integrate that over the two minute period, it's not a whole lot of light. But it is a whole lot of light that that leaf has to deal with all at once. And that the leaf cannot do. It's just it's overwhelming the system. Do you have any estimates of what what the fraction is of that pulse light relative to the uh, to the, um, the, the, the background light and the normal light? No, pretty small. Um, at m yeah, at most a few percent. But so it's it's not really the, the averaging it out doesn't take into account that all of this light is coming just in a very, very brief burst, and that is more than the leaf can, can handle. And doing that over and over and over. Yes? Uh, similar to the first question, is, do you think that the circadian cycle has anything to do with the, uh, with the response that you see? Um, no, I don't think so, because when we tried to maintain an electron transport rate of 70, we saw a completely flat line. The quantum yield of photosystem 2 was completely stable, so there was no evidence there of any kind of circadian rhythm, while at a higher electron transport rate we see that the quantum yield starts dropping over time. So it doesn't seem to me like it's the circadian rhythm that is involved. Yes? Um, yeah, gr great question. And plants definitely adapt to different light levels, and Xu Yang Zen um, has done work on that as well. So if you grow plants under higher light levels, they will actually be capable of achieving much higher electron transport rates. They m are making more reaction centers to help use all of that light energy. Uh, there's definitely acclimation going on. You see this in practical application with a light going on the Well, so you mean the LEDs? Or? LEDs. 
So the LEDs are going on and off at a frequency of 1,000 hertz. Um, you don't see it. Yeah. Yeah, but there's no reason to do it at a at a different frequency. You can do it at a very high frequency. My understanding is that it doesn't harm LEDs at all. Uh, Tessa may be able to. Uh, corroborate that but um, so we're doing that already with a lot of lighting that we are exposed to every single day a lot of this lighting is being controlled using the same pulse width modulation um, so uh, there was other old research where people were actually looking at how does the frequency of the light affect the photosynthetic rate and there was a lot of really bad science out there um, but it turns it looks like there is no effect of frequency to speak of, and um, we've um, tested that as well. That was really boring data. If we keep the same integrated light level and change the frequency, the plant does exactly the same thing. This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.